Okay, hey everybody, welcome uh, to this mini module on what is sleep. Uh, my name is Mary Coughlin. I'm a neonatal nurse practitioner and the president of Caring Essentials Collaborative. I'm giving you greetings from a super chilly Boston. And um, let's just kick this off. This is a very short module, um, followed by a series of additional modules that will explore what is sleep with regards to the clinician, the family in the NICU, and the infant. So here we go. So um, as you all know, I'm completely addicted to YouTube videos, and I'm hoping that this video you'll find um, very informative and not too terribly scary. So give me one sec to just pull this up for you. Um, here we go. And I'm hitting play. My name is Matthew Walker. I am a professor of neuroscience and psychology at the University of California, Berkeley. And I am the author of the book, Why We Sleep. We certainly know that a lack of sleep will actually prevent your brain from being able to initially make new memories. So it's almost as though without sleep, the memory inbox of the brain shuts down and you can't commit new experiences to memory. So those new incoming informational emails are just bounced and you end up feeling as though you're amnesic. You can't essentially make and uh, create those new memories. We also know that a lack of sleep will lead to an increased development of a toxic protein in the brain that is called beta amyloid. And that is associated with Alzheimer's disease because it is during deep sleep at night when a sewage system within the brain actually kicks into high gear and it starts to wash away this toxic protein, beta amyloid. So if you're not getting enough sleep each and every night, more of that Alzheimer's related protein will build up. The more protein that builds up, the greater your risk of going on to develop dementia in later life. What are the effects of sleep deprivation on the body? Well, there are many different effects. Firstly, we know that sleep deprivation affects the reproductive system. We know that men who are sleeping just five to six hours a night have a level of testosterone, which is that of someone 10 years their senior. So a lack of sleep will age you by almost a decade in terms of that aspect of virility and wellness. We also know that a lack of sleep impacts your immune system. So after just one night of four to five hours of sleep, there is a 70% reduction in critical anti-cancer fighting immune cells called natural killer cells. And that's the reason that we know that short sleep duration predicts your risk for developing numerous forms of cancer. And that list currently includes cancer of the bowel, cancer of the prostate, as well as cancer of the breast. In fact, the link between a lack of sleep and cancer is now so strong that recently the World Health Organization decided to classify any form of nighttime shift work as a probable carcinogen. So in other words, jobs that may induce cancer because of a disruption of your sleep-wake rhythms. We also know that a lack of sleep impacts your cardiovascular system because it is during deep sleep at night that you receive this most wonderful form of effectively blood pressure medication. Your heart rate drops, your blood pressure goes down. If you're not getting sufficient sleep, you're not getting that reboot of the cardiovascular system. So your blood pressure rises. You have, if you're getting six hours of sleep or less, a 200% increased risk of having a fatal heart attack or a stroke in your lifetime. There is a global experiment that is performed on 1.6 billion people twice a year, and it's called daylight savings time. And we know that in the spring, when we lose one hour of sleep, we see a subsequent 24% increase in heart attacks the following day. Another question perhaps is, what is the recycle rate of a human being? How long can we actually last without sleep before we start to see declines in your brain function or even impairments within your body? And the answer seems to be about 16 hours of wakefulness. Once you get past 16 hours of being awake, that's when we start to see mental deterioration and physiological deterioration in the body. 
We know that after you've been awake for 19 or 20 hours, your mental capacity is so impaired that you would be as deficient as someone who is legally drunk behind the wheel of a car. So if you were to ask me what is the recycle rate of a human being, it does seem to be about 16 hours and we need about eight hours of sleep to repair the damage of wakefulness. Wakefulness essentially is low level brain damage. Let me just bring back the slide deck, guys. Um, so I would love to know your thoughts about that video. Um, I know some of the information that he shares um, can be pretty scary, um, but it's obviously evidence-based um, and, and true. And so I think understanding how sleep deprivation affects us as adults um, really highlights the extreme vulnerability of the babies that we take care of in the newborn intensive care unit and their need for sleep. But I will get into that a little bit more when I start talking about um, the baby aspects of protected sleep. We know that sleep and wakefulness are endogenous recurring behavioral states that reflect a coordinated change in the dynamic functioning um, and organization of the brain. And the purpose of sleep is really to optimize physiology, behavior, and health. Um, and these, um, this process is um, regulated by circadian rhythmicity and homeostatic processes that really manage our wakefulness and our, and our sleepy states. Um, have you ever had the experience, right, um, when you're coming home from night shift and maybe even day shift and you're pulling into your driveway and you think, oh, my gosh how did I get here? You don't remember your drive. Um, that's, you know, kind of a, a tip off that you are definitely sleepy, if not sleep deprived. Um, our brains love processes, they love patterns. And so um, anything that we do frequently, right, just kind of gets um, imprinted in our brain as a pattern, and we can go on what's called autopilot, right. Um, but that's certainly not a safety net to feel like, oh, it's okay then if I fall asleep behind the wheel. It's absolutely not okay to fall asleep behind the wheel. And I'll share with you that I, um, you know, after years of um, sleep deprivation from working so many nights, I had a pretty scary um, experience and a wake up call when I was stationed out in California. And I was driving back from dropping my husband off at work and I fell asleep behind the wheel and flipped the car over. I was not hurt, thank God. I had my seatbelt on and um, just got a wicked burn from the from the seatbelt strap. Um, but you know, they called the emergency services and they took me out of the car and put me on the flat board and all that business just to be safe. Um, but the policeman that responded was like screaming in my face, um, asking me, what was I doing? Um, you know, say, telling me that he thought I was reaching down to pick up a, a, a beverage or something off the floor or something like that. And um, as the gentleman in the video said, I was completely amnesic. I had no memory. All I remember was I was driving and then all of a sudden I woke up upside down in the car. Um, and we, you know this, right? You hear of this um, in the UK, in the US, in Canada, all over the world. Um, people, the loss of life associated with um, driving fatigued and driving sleepy. Think about that um, perspective with regards to being on duty and the risk that we take when we are sleepy and we're unable to focus um, in caring for these patients. Medication errors and other types of errors are dramatically um, increased in the setting of sleepy uh, workers. So what does constitute sleep health? Well, it's a very um, complex and interconnected phenomenon. Um, sleep health is, is impacted by your general state of wellness, right? Your, um, your genetic blueprint, do you come from a long line of good sleepers or do you come from a long line of insomniacs? That's gonna influence your sleep health. Your level of wellness or illness can also influence your sleep health. Um, I'm sure when you think about like the last time you had a cold or the flu, you tended to sleep more. And it's during those um, sleep bouts that actually your body is trying to consolidate and organize a um, targeted immune response to whatever it is that you're fighting. Um, so sleep and the immune system are very um, interconnected. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in the next module. But all of these things come into play, as does, though, the quality of your sleep set you up for either wellness or illness. So for sleep deprived people, again, as the video portrayed, 
Um, if you're sleep deprived, it increases your risk for cancer. It increases your risk for cardiovascular disease. It also increases your risk for depression, mental illness, and, and those types of things, as do those particular pathologic processes undermine the quality of your sleep. And there are four dimensions, or five dimensions rather, of optimal sleep. And they all um, play a key role in your sleep health. So in the video, he talked a lot about duration, right? Um, that's how long you sleep, right? Do you get six hours, seven hours, eight hours, nine hours? Um, what we know is that the younger you are, the more hours of sleep you need. So as adults, seven to eight hours is recommended. Adolescents, nine to 10. Young children, maybe 10 to 12 hours, you know, as the younger you get. And we know that healthy um, term babies require anywhere from, mm, I think it's 15 to 18 hours in a 24 hour period. The further we go back into the more immature patient population, the youngest people's, uh, <laughs> the youngest people um, require anywhere from like 22, I'm sorry, 21 to 22 hours a day. Now it's not a solid sleep, right? We sleep in cycles and our cycles begin with non-REM sleep and as adults, right? And there are four stages to non-REM and we, we kind of, we start drowsy, then we go deeper, 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 and into stage four is our deep sleep. Then we transition into REM, rapid eye movement sleep. And then we either wake up or we go back into a non-REM cycle. And we have, uh, you know, se several series of these cycles of sleep that facilitate or um, determine the quality of the sleep that we've experienced. And these dimensions of sleep, you know, certainly start with duration, right? So it's the total amount of sleep obtained per 24 hours. And there are some folks, right, that are really great nappers. Um, I'm so jealous of these people because I can't nap. If I lay down for a nap, I'll see you tomorrow. Um, but so it's not necessarily continuous sleep. It's the amount of sleep you get in 24 hours. That's the duration. The sleep continuity or sleep efficiency, which is another dimension, is your ability to fall asleep. And generally, it should take you about 15, 20 minutes to fall asleep. And then I, ideally, you stay asleep for whatever the amount of time uh, that is determined to give you that um, sense of being refreshed and rested and that sort of thing. Um, what they recommend, I'm sure you've had this experience, um, if you're lying in bed and maybe you just worked a 12 hour shift and you're coming back the next day and you're looking at the clock and you're like, oh my gosh, fall asleep, fall asleep as I've got to get up in 15 minutes uh, or I'm sorry, <laughs> I've got to get up in a few hours and you start activating a stress response that actually compromises and undermines your ability to fall asleep. So they recommend get up, move around, maybe read a book, don't put the lights on, don't stimulate yourself, and then try and come back to sleep. And there are other types of sensory things that you can do to help um, get yourself to sleep. Um, you know, t taking a sound bath or listening to um, different types of auditory um, stimulation that can relax your mind. Um, different scents, right? Lavender scent can maybe cup of tea, you know, um, chamomile tea may help you sleep. The timing of your sleep also um, can impact the quality of your sleep. And that's when you sleep in a 24 hour period, right? So for example, night shift workers have to sleep during the daytime and the daytime can really be um, a difficult time to sleep because we are programmed to sleep at night, right? Light stimulates our suprachiasmic nucleus and makes us alert. And so if you're working nights and you have to sleep during the day, it's really smart to get room darkening shades and really maybe even an eye mask and these types of things to really help you fall asleep. And then the other dimensions of sleep that tell you whether or not your sleep was restorative is um, the level of alertness. Do you feel alert? Or are you still sleepy? That's also speaking to the quality of your sleep. And then the satisfaction, which is a super subjective phenomenon. But did you did you feel like it was a good sleep or it was a poor sleep? So these are the dimensions of sleep. And these dimensions of sleep can impact the, your sleep health, but also your general health as well. And so the, here's um, some of the references that I um, utilized to develop this module. The next module will be looking at sleep and protected sleep for the professional. I hope you'll come back. I hope you found this enjoyable. Um, as always, take care and care well. Bye.